Hello and welcome everyone. I am Kimberly Tipton, Director of Communications at Payton and Regal and your event host for today. A couple quick housekeeping items before we get started. Everyone is in a listen-only mode throughout the presentation today. We will have a recording and a copy of the presentation in PDF form available for everyone after the event, so please watch your inboxes for that. And finally, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the prepared comments. So please don't be shy. Ask your questions via the Q&A box on your screen, and Jeffrey Cleveland will attempt to answer as many questions as possible for an engaging conversation. So don't be shy. Send us your questions. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us today for our 2014 Economic and Market Outlook, Better, Lower, Steeper, Stronger, Tighter, Weaker. Jeffrey Cleveland, our Chief Economist and one of the the principals at Payton and Regal will tell you a little bit more about what that means for the markets and for your investments. Jeffrey, like I said, is a principal and the chief economist at Payton and Regal. You may have seen him this morning on CNBC Squawk Box. He was giving our reaction to the economic data this morning, CPI and claims data. Uh, an interesting fact about Jeffrey, in case you haven't met him before or been to any of our other webcast events, he is an ocean water swimmer, open ocean water swimmer. So that's a, an interesting point if you ever have a chance to meet him. He is one of the few that's uh, done the triple crown. So that um, is something that we're always happy to share. He helps develop views on the U.S. and global economy and their impacts on the markets. And we hope that he will be a really great resource for you today. And um, anytime you have questions, please don't be shy to reach out to us. Uh, without further ado, Jeffrey, please go ahead. Thank you, Kim, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Our New Year's resolution was to seek brevity and clarity, to be short and concise. And in that spirit, we chose just six words for our outlook to present it. And as Kim said already, those, those six words are better, lower, steeper, stronger, tighter, weaker. And if you are short on time or short on patience, then you could probably log off now. And that would be the summary of the, of the year as we see it. But if you are interested and you want to delve a bit deeper, we're going to take the next little bit to, to dive into these issues in a, in a bit more detail. Uh, before we begin, though, I, I did want to pause and point out this nice little napkin graphic and it, it strikes me as funny this time of year. It's the time to do annual economic outlooks. We do it. Everyone's doing it. And two of my favorites are the, the World Bank's outlook and the Bureau, or excuse me, the Bank of International Settlements, the BIS outlook. And what I noticed was they were sort of pointing in opposite directions. One was worried about inflation. One was worried about deflation. And it struck me that this graphic is probably the most accurate. If we get if we watch a number of these forecasts, well. There's a chance at least one will be right. We hope it's ours, but we're going to give you a roadmap for how we're thinking about the world, and we'll be able to discuss and see where we're right, and probably more importantly, where we're wrong as the year progresses. So let's dive right in. Better. What do we mean by better? We mean better GDP growth. That's the first one, and it's perhaps, for us, the most important one. We think growth for the U.S., in 2014 will be better than 2013. 2013, although we don't actually have the full slate of data for the year, it looks like to us it's going to come out to be about 2%, maybe a little bit higher growth for 2013. That's down from 2012 when growth was 2.8%. But we think 2014 will be a bit better. Why? Well, one of the things we like to do, there's so much data available out there it's literally like trying to drink out of a fire hose. There's so much data. So you have to filter it correctly. We're always looking for new ways to do that. If you've listened to us before, we point to leading indicators as being a great way to filter. Another way that we've come up with recently is a heat map. It's a visualization of a lot of underlying macro data, high frequency data, such as weekly data, but also longer term data, monthly and quarterly. And visually, I think you could just Sit back from your screen, relax, let your eyes sort of go out of focus, and that would tell enough of the story here from 2006 on the left-hand side out to 2014. 
When it's red, that's bad. When it's green, that's good. Green being green shoots, you know, springtime. Things are getting better. And you can look to the far right, and I think you see some green shoots. I think you see a lot more green, uh, especially on the economic activity front, which is a host of different indicators that we think are good leaders. Housing looks better. Uh, housing starts in particular, and, and the home price index. The labor market even looks, I would say, I would call that yellow. It's not red, but it's, it's not quite green yet, so we're not quite to, to springtime in the labor market, but certainly we, we're, we're improving. And the financial market statistics, credit spreads, and, and things like this that point to risk those look better. Important for us, though, that's the first important thing from this chart. The far right looks better. What it's not looking like is the, you know, the red that we saw in 2007, 2008, or 2009. And it's not quite back to how green it looked in 2006. So that's very important to us. So when I said to you at the start of this call that bet, better growth, how much better, you might ask? I don't think it's going to be a 2006 type scenario where we had 3 to 4% type growth. We still think we're at 2.5 type growth in, in the coming year. That's a little bit, that's a shade under the consensus. Uh, it's, it's not dire by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not quite as optimistic as some of the growth forecasts that we've seen out there. Uh, and, you know, why is that? You know, a couple things going on here. I, I think a 3% or even a 4% growth rate at this point is expecting a lot out of the economy that we have. Uh, one way we've looked at this is the historical data, uh, that, that just the economy that we're faced with. You can see here the early 80s, the early 90s, 2001 era of recovery, and then the recent recovery. And we've just been stuck in a slower growth environment. And I think, uh, I don't expect just sort of the spontaneous emergence from that in, in the coming year. Growth will be better, but not not extraordinarily better. Why is that? Well, I'm, I'm always struggling with ways to explain this that are concise. Here's what we've come up with in our latest set of charts. That is a pond. That is a pond that you know, looks to be frozen over, uh, that someone might skate on in the wintertime. And what happens with the economy, but also in the financial system, is that it takes years and years to build up the trust, the relationships, the credit interaction uh, that, that we had as of 2006, 2007. It takes years to build up to that. It takes moments, minutes, days to see a crack in the ice and to send people scattering. And then even if the, even if the financial system looks better, even if things look solid enough to skate on, it takes a while to get people to come back out on that ice. That, that progress takes a long period of time. When we set out at the beginning of this, we, we, saw, we thought this was a seven to 10 year type cycle. We're seven years from the 2007 period. So maybe we're on the cusp of people feeling a bit better and willing to take more risk, willing to take more credit, willing to engage in new projects, willing to pick up hiring. We may be on the forefront of that. And, and that's really why we think while we're improving, we might not be yet to this three to 4% type boom that people want to see. That's one chart how I would characterize it. The other thing to consider is we are fairly long into the cycle. If, you, if history is any guide, and history is certainly doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, and so there's some lessons we can learn. We're 54 months into the current expansion, if you date the expansion starting June 2009. The average in the post-war era is only about 58. The longest in the post-war era is the 1990s, We'll call it the Clinton Greenspan boom. That was 120 months. So if you think we're headed to that new scenario, then maybe you think this has longer to run. And the average over a longer period of time is much shorter. So the point really is we're fairly far along into the recovery. It would be unusual at this point for a rapid pickup to occur. Usually late, this far in, 54 months in, you're seeing growth sort of hanging out and maybe topping off and, and slowing down. It's unusual to paint it as being much higher. So these are some of the reasons why we think growth is better, but we're still cautious. Some people ask us, hey, what's been holding growth back, and is that changing at all in 2013, 2014? To answer that, we, we made this chart here. It's sort of like a, an attribution 
for you know, your bond total return, your equity total return, where are your returns coming from? This is sort of like where is your growth coming from or where is your detractor from growth? And you can see early on this was all about investment. It was a pullback in investment activity. That was the recession 2008, 2009, housing investment and business investment. That's abated. That's gone away. The worst is definitely behind. Consumer, which is your dark blue, looks okay to us. Growing 2 3% year on year. It's, it's boosting the economy. What's been dragging the last two years, 2011, 2012 on this chart, and also importantly this year in 2013, government spending. That's expected to recede out over uh, the, the coming year. That won't be a drag to the negative. And if housing holds in there, business CapEx holds in there, we can have a pretty solid growth number in the coming year when you, when you do sort of the, mechan the accounting way of, of coming up with your GDP number. Somewhere between, again, 2 and 3% we think is reasonable for the coming year. I won't engage in a, an argument will be 2.5 versus 2.6 or 2.7. I don't think that's important for investors. It's important to understand, are we slowing, are we getting better, and how much better are we getting? So that's how we characterize it. Some of you might think, wow, housing, housing can't contribute to growth. We have a new bubble in housing. That, that's not going to be a, a source of economic activity in the year ahead. And we would take issue with that. We'd love to argue a bit more about that with you. The reason we think that we could have more housing construction activity in 2014 and in beyond is that we have built so few homes in the last five years. This chart, which I have on the screen now, slide 10, if you're following along on the audio version, that chart shows you from 1984 to present, your housing starts and the share of residential building in the GDP accounts. Housing starts, single family starts, have been below 1 million annualized for five consecutive years. This has simply not happened before. In this, on this chart, you can see it happened, that a little blip there, but in the post-war data, so 1946 to present, we've never seen a period where we've built so few homes. There, there is a scarcity of construction activity going on out there. In many markets, this is showing up anecdotally when we talk to people about the, the, the dearth, the lack of supply, and it's also showing up in, in the home price index which in, in Los Angeles here, our, our, our home, 20% uh, year on year. Now, we think there is a need to build new homes. We think we will go back to the 1 million annualized mark eventually. I'm not sure this happens in 2014, since we're at about 600,000 or so annualized, but we do think structurally this will come back. Again, on that 7 to 10 year outlook, we'll, we'll head back in that direction. But this should continue to boost activity uh, in GDP in 2014 and beyond. So growth is looking better. That's number one, better growth. The second one, lower. I think lower is lower inflation or low continued low inflation and lower Fed funds for perhaps longer than people think. So even though growth is getting better, we're still not seeing any movement on, on Fed funds. What is it that the FOMC is looking for? Well, I think this is the best way to think about it, slide 12. You can dig into the minutes, if you have spare time, from the last meeting, from the December FOMC meeting, and sort of 15, 16 pages in, you'll come across some interesting information, and then here's one of the charts. It shows where the members of the FOMC, not Mr. Bernanke or Yellen, but everyone, where do they think the unemployment rate will get to eventually. What's the long-term unemployment rate? And they still think that it's somewhere between 5.2, as you see on this chart, and 5.5. So they still think we have a ways to go before the unemployment rate is back to where it's eventually going to end up in a healthy, full labor market. We're, we're quite a distance from there, even at, as we learned last Friday, 6.7%. So this is what they want to see. It's the, it's the preponderance, it's the majority of the, of the committee. It's not going to be uh, changed to a large degree by any one person moving around. This is, this is the, the core of the group, wants to see lower unemployment. They also are worried that inflation is well below target. So we, we drew this chart for you of their favorite 
inflation gauge. It shows year-on-year -year percent change on the y-axis, and then the, the last 10 years or so, the gray shaded area is the target range. They would love to see, you know, I would, I think they would welcome 2.5% inflation for a time. They would love that. But you can see we're at 1.1%, maybe a little higher than that, and we've been there most of this year. On average, in the recovery, so since 2009, we've been at 1.4%. So we've been very low on inflation. This irks, this annoys, I, I think, the, the monetary policy makers, especially given the fact that they've done unprecedented monetary policy. They've done QE2, they've done QE3, they have kept rates low for five years running now. So they would love to see unemployment rate lower and then inflation higher. And we're not there yet. So they're not worried about being too easy, we don't think, on monetary policy. They don't worry that rates have been low for too long. They see it as we have more, much more work to do on the unemployment rate, and we have ample room to continue to be easy because inflation is so low. So we don't think they're close to hiking. It's not something we have in our outlook for 2014. I think it's something that could happen in 2014. 15 or maybe even later than that. I know some people out there probably are not happy to hear that. Uh, we would love to see uh, the you know short-term interest rates higher, particularly if you're a saver, right? You want you want to earn better uh, returns on your on your savings. But we don't think that's going to happen in 2014 and maybe not even in 2015. And here's why: this is a simple way to think of it. It's the a matrix or a quadrant. The FOMC uh, has drafted up, at least one member uses this. It shows you the, the blue quadrant is where we are. You can see where we've been in 2011, 2012, 2013. It just draws the intersection of the unemployment rate and core inflation. You can see the 2013, you can see where we might be in 2014, where we might be in 2015. And right now, based on FOMC forecast, they don't even have us dipping into the bottom left quadrant until sometime in 2016. So I don't think they're going to be antsy or you know quick to want to hike. And based on their outlook over the next few years, they don't expect to be in a condition where they, they would want to hike when the unemployment rate is closer to 5.2 and inflation is back above that 2% threshold. So it doesn't look like the hikes of any kind or on the horizon anytime soon. If you want another bit of evidence for this, again, you could dig through these reports. They, they issue these economic projections now. And this just lines up when each participant, the number of participants there on the y-axis, how many think that the rate hike is uh, the appropriate timing of the first rate hike. So when would the first hike be to the Fed funds rate? Ask themselves that question. You can see for 2014 there. A few people, as of March, four of them, thought it would come in 2014. And you can see how it's evolved over time. That goes from the March projection over to the December projection. Interesting for us is really just focus on the maroon. I think that's a maroon color or a red color and how it's changed. Uh, there's now a few people out in the 2016 bucket, so three people. And so we say to ourselves, who are those three people? I, I think it's Janet Yellen. I think it is Rosengren, Mr. Rosengren of the Boston Fed, and I think I would also put uh, Mr. Evans of the Chicago Fed into that bucket. That's just a guess. They don't actually put the names of the FOMC members on there, but that's my best guess. So more people are entertaining now the possibility of 2016 being the first rate hike. It's not completely off the board. So low inflation, lower Fed funds for longer. That's the second one. Third one, in this environment, we think the curve, the treasury curve, remains steep and maybe it goes steeper. Now, keep in mind, these are the outlooks over the course of the year. So, you know, over the next few months, it could flatten out for some reason. But we, we think when we look out over the full 2014, if we're right about the economic environment, we're right about the inflation environment, we're right about monetary policy, we think the curve will, will be remain steep and maybe get a little bit steeper. When I, when I talk about the yield curve, what do I mean? Well, there's a few different ways to slice it. You know, one that I like to look at is Fed funds to 
10. So the difference in yield between a 10-year bond and Fed funds, and you probably, if you're sitting there at home, you're like, well, how much deeper can the curve get? It's already very steep, and, and you're absolutely right. We look back over 20, 25 years here, and we're close to the steepest levels on this gauge. It seems to be, historically at least, big caveat, historically there's this level to which it gets about 300 or 3 percentage points difference between Fed funds being close to zero and in your in your tens uh, that that's held. We 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 got to there a couple times in the cycle. We we recently reapproached that. So for us that seems that seems like a reasonable point um, to 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 go back to over time. Uh, if you might be asking though why why would that happen if the Fed is going to keep uh, rates pinned down the overnight rate why would you know the curve steepen and for us it's uh it comes back to a cartoon strip. So maybe the, you know, cartoon is the best way to explain monetary policy. Uh, as everyone knows, the Fed is tapering its asset purchase program. It's getting out of the QE business, let's say. And it wants to focus on so-called forward guidance. It wants to focus on talking about the future path of interest rates. And, well, quite frankly, that's, that's very popular in the academic literature. Uh, in reality, we think that's going to be a, a much different uh, task. And the, the reason I use this comic strip is because I think, if you look at the comic strip, you go back to, I think this is 1951 when this first came out. This was the first time that Lucy and Charlie Brown played the, the football game where Charlie Brown expected her to hold the football. Lucy, of course, found a reason, you see there, to take the football away. Surprised Charlie Brown, he tumbled on his head. And, he, you know, he repeatedly went back to this throughout the comic strip over the decades and he, you know, to my knowledge, he never learned his lesson. Well, in, in my analogy here, the bond market is Charlie Brown, and Lucy is Janet Yellen, and I don't think the bond market is going to be as, well, dumb as Charlie Brown. The bond market is always going to wonder, okay, Lucy's promised to keep that ball here, by which we mean Janet has promised to keep rates low, but is she going to renege on that promise if we get an inflation print that's a little higher, or the unemployment rate falls a little faster than many people think. Bond market participants, investors are going to, to for lack of a better term, front run that, want to be out in front. And it's going to make them very skeptical, and it's going to make guidance harder. The Fed can say, hey, no, no, we aren't hiking, but I don't think it's going to be an easy game for, for, the, for the market. And that could lead to some pressure uh, for yields to rise. Now, 10-year yields may be, in our opinion, You'll see at the very end in our summary slide, don't have a lot more upside room over the course of the year. But shorter term maturities maybe are more susceptible to this, this uh, Charlie Brown and Lucy relationship. And that part, so Fed funds to fives, that part could, could also steepen a little bit as the year goes. So I think this is really an important battle to watch in the bond market. I'm not sure the academics uh, are, are, are going to win this battle with the bond market. So that's the Lucy and Charlie. And, you know, this has played out over the course of 2013. This really is the story of interest rates in 2013, the market second-guessing the Fed, the market wanting to be out in front of the Fed. Uh, Eric Hovey, our very, you know, wonderful uh, low-duration strategist, I went to him, I said, hey, I need a way to track, I, I want to tell this story, is this, is this viable? And he said, he said, give me 20 minutes. And he sent me this chart so I've been using it. We've been updating it. I think it really tells the story of interest rates. It's just one line that asks, at that point in history, at that present time, how many months into the future is it until the market expects the first rate hike? It's a very simple question. You can see it, it hangs out around two years for a while, 24, 25 months. When Bernanke brings up tapering, it comes in rapidly. The market starts expecting a rate hike sooner. The market gets, you know... Excited about rate hikes. September FOMC, you can see we have it marked there. It goes back out, closer to 20 months. Again, it comes back in in December. So, and this explains a lot of volatility further out the curve in rate in rates markets, in our opinion. So the market is this is what the market does. It's always looking for a new information and testing the Fed whether they're really going to stick to this this forecast or this promise. Are they credible to keep rates low for longer? I expect this sort of this volatility to, to continue in the coming year. So better growth, 
low inflation, low Fed funds at least out into 2015, perhaps beyond. Curve remains steeper. Rate volatility because of this battle between the market and the academics, between Charlie and Lucy. If I think about all of this, the next big thing for us is that dollar probably strengthens. We're talking about environment where interest rates are either rising longer term interest rates or expected to rise sooner, where the economy is doing better, where inflation is not that big of an issue. That I think is a good environment for US investment activity. Capital flows come in. Uh, the dollar is, is, is strengthening in, in this scenario. So we, we like that. We, we think that's the, the next piece of this puzzle. A few things people used to say to me over the years, U.S. has a, a massive trade deficit, therefore the dollar must go down. Well, the, the interesting thing is that that excuse is sort of gone now, right? If you look at the trade deficit as a share of GDP, that's the blue line on this chart, it's, it shrunk pretty dramatically in the recession. It continues to be not very worrisome at this point. Maybe that's from the shale revolution. People are asking at home, hey, what about the shale revolution? How's that impacting it? Uh, I could reduce your know, your demand for import imported uh, crude and other types of energy. So that that picture is actually looking really good. And folks that were pointing to that as being a dollar negative, dollar doom, dollar bears out there. Sorry, sorry, uh, guys and gals. The other thing is people would show me the deficit. The U.S. is running this massive federal deficit. People said. And that, you know, that's a weakness for the dollar. People are going to want to get out of the dollar. They want to be anywhere but the dollar. Well, again, we, are, we need to remove that risk that's been looming over the market a little bit. Here's a picture. We're calling it the incredible shrinking U.S. budget deficit. It's gone from 10% of GDP, with, which is, uh, yes, I admit, that is worrisome for investors. But that's where we were in 2009. Now we're back to... Uh, about 4%, just under 4%, 3.92% if you want to be exact as a share of GDP. It's a great story. It's a very rapid uh, improvement in the federal finances. So that's no longer a doom and gloom for the dollar. Interest rates, usually when interest rates are low, then the dollar is weak. There's a, there's a pretty you know, sort of loose relationship there. So as interest rates rise, that should be good. So the dollar should strengthen, we think. That, that's the next one. Uh, that brings us to number five. Tighter. Tighter or higher, we wrestled with the term to use here, but we went with tighter. And what we mean here is, I, you know, I said at the beginning, the biggest macro question we face is, is, is growth going to be better, right? In a related issue, we always ask ourselves, are we going to have a recession or not? It's a very binary question, binary outcome, but it's important, I think, for the credit sensitive sectors, the sectors that are more uh, driven by economic activity. And by that, I mean investment grade corporate, but also sub-investment grade corporate. So we still think that absent a recession, that spreads can stay tight, credit spreads, and maybe even move tighter. Now, I, I don't think we have a high conviction on this with regard to investment grade spreads, just because they're, they're already quite... Uh, tight uh, relative to history, although not as tight as they were, say, the 2003 to 2007 period. I think we're more uh, favorable to the, to the high yield argument, to the sub-investment grade argument that, that spreads can stay there or even tighten a little bit more. Because if we're right, if we're talking about 2% growth or 2.5% growth, low inflation, no hike from the Fed, a stronger dollar, capital coming in looking for place to park in the U.S., all of those things could find a home and high yield as being attractive, we still think, in the coming year. So that's the tighter argument. Why did I say higher earlier? Higher, I was thinking about equity prices. Uh, someone, I think, maybe will send me today, this happens almost daily, they send me a chart. The chart plots the Fed's balance sheet versus the S&P 500. And then the, the, the email sender says to me, oh, I'm worried you know, if the tapering happens, stocks will collapse. And so, you know, my, my, my gut reaction to that chart is, of course, to come up with anything else that I can, you know, that's correlated to uh, the, the S&P 500 and send the chart back to them. So we, we've tried a few things. One that I've seen that's really interesting is uh, the number of words in the FOMC statement. There's so many words now in the FOMC statement. If you've seen it, it's like six paragraphs long. 
That's gone up dramatically since 2008, and lo and behold, so has the S&P 500. Uh, if you want to get a, a little more, um, you know, maybe playful, let's say, you can look at prices of, of anything, really, that, that's just gone up in the last four or five years. And, it, of course, it correlates highly with the S&P 500. Does, the question we keep asking is, is the, is the correlation spurious? Is, is there actually some fundamental driver here? And we, we don't think so. I think the best thing that could happen is that the Fed tapers over the course of the year, as we expect, every meeting they dial it back, $10 billion. They shutter QE3 by the end of the year. And equities stay where they are or even move up to all-time highs. That would be a wonderful outcome because then I would stop getting this volume of emails. The other thing I think that is interesting to point out is profits. Profits as a share of GDP look great. They still remain uh, extraordinarily high. This is not a 1999 scenario. You can see clearly from the chart profits began to, to send a warning signal to equity investors, you know, maybe as early as when, when Greenspan, if everyone remembers, uttered those famous words, irrational exuberance, sometime during 2000, or excuse me, 1996, profits sort of trended lower and equities went higher. And this appeared to be a bubble, or in retrospect, I think is a, is a bubble. And we're in a different situation, I would, we would argue today. So even though, you know, as, a, as, as a, uh, an investor in bonds, we would, we, you know, it's in our interest to say, hey, bonds do better than stocks. I think we have to step back and say that, you know, equities can continue to uh, enjoy a solid performance, not the 30% year-on-year or 30%, excuse me, total return that we saw in 2013, perhaps. But the Fed is not going to pull the, the rug out from under equities with the tapering. What's weaker? Weaker is our sixth and final word. And what do we mean by that? Well, if growth is better, inflation, is as, as we think, is stabilizing, interest rates in front end remain low, maybe longer and drift higher, dollar gets stronger. That's really the key. For me, I have to ask myself, if that's all true, if the dollar strengthens, as we expect, who is hurt by that? Who are the big beneficiaries? of the weaker dollar trade um, and who, who could be hurt the most? Well, for us, I think the oil is a, is a candidate. I, I, I sort of just simplistically think of it as two sides of the same coin. If the dollar is weak, oil prices are ref, reflecting that in terms of higher, higher uh, barrel uh, dollars per barrel prices. Um, so it's just the flip side. So if the dollar is strengthening, that should take some of the gusto out of that the, the oil price. Pretty good relationship with that over time, so I, I like that. The other one, I think I'm, I'm more highly convicted on this one, and we've been showing this chart since we issued a note in May of last year, which was called uh, Has Gold Lost Its Luster, or Has Gold Lost Its Glitter, or something of that. I forget the exact title. But we made the argument that on a real basis, so inflation adjusted, you know, gold has two peaks and it would became really overvalued in the late 70s, early 80s, and perhaps for good reason. High inflation, people worried about the dollar being debased by the central bank at the time. So they all there was a flight into, into the real hard assets. Problem is, Volcker arrived, hiked interest rates, money supply expansion stopped, halted, and inflation came down dramatically, and with it, the gold price. In longer period of time, the average is sort of around three on this ratio. Again, from 2000 on, we had a nice little run-up, uh, perhaps for good reasons. A lot of central banks on a global basis were in the business of adding to their portfolios, not just the Fed, not just the ECB, not just the BOE. We can think of China as being a very big balance sheet uh, in this regard. So maybe there is some reason for investors to be in real assets. But I think, again, we got to an overbought, an overvalued level there, and we've given back some of that, but I still think we're overvalued. If you're wondering what this suggests on a dollar price basis, it's closer, if we come back down to a long-term average, 800 or so dollars uh, per ounce. So I think gold is, is another candidate there for, for, for weakness. The other thing is globally, uh, this has been a great environment for new entrants to the bond market. So people to borrow 
outside the U.S. because capital was, was going out of the U.S. It was going out of dollar assets. It was looking for higher yielding opportunities. And so just like in any sort of boom time, when things are good, people are willing to, to go in search of yield. We think some of that has, that has occurred. And the flip side of that, of course, is that borrowers that otherwise wouldn't be able to access the global bond markets enjoyed access. Uh, roughly, maybe not the best analogy, but for me, somewhat similar to a subprime borrower in you know, the 2004 to 2006 era that otherwise wouldn't be able to access mortgage financing, but because of liquidity conditions, was able to do so. So you had a lot of first-time buyers. You had a lot of people that were uh, subprime that could get in, into the market. Similar story globally. So this ch this chart just tells you, it's interesting phrase, international debut in issuance. So it's their first-time issuers. And as a, as a sign that capital has been flowing freely. And if the Fed is tapering, so that is off. If the dollar debasement fears are gone, so people are not running from the dollar. In fact, the dollar is strengthening. Gold is losing some of its upward uh, momentum. Then there are other sources out there, global capital, that have received global capital flows that might come under pressure in 2014 and even beyond. So the, they also are susceptible to, to, to a weaker. So that's gold, oil, and some global capital flows, we think, that have been in robust in, in prior years in the QE era. That will ebb as the, as the tide of liquidity uh, recedes a little bit. So that's weaker. So the quick conclusion is better growth, lower inflation in Fed funds, steeper or still steep treasury curve, stronger U.S. dollar, I think, in this environment, still tight, maybe a little tighter on credit spreads, especially if we don't have a recession or a recession scare and we don't have any sort of idiosyncratic events like so the Enron period or the S&P downgrade or the Euro crisis of the summer of 2011. That should be a good environment for, for credit. And the weaker candidates at this point, in this scenario, if you follow the first uh, five, I think gold is your, is a, your primary candidate, oil, and the, the global capital flows story. So that's the summary. Now, we said at the beginning that perhaps the most important part of this is not going to be where we're right. It's going to be where we're wrong. So we listed a couple of things here where we, where we think we could be wrong. I won't go through all of them, so hopefully you'll have this afterwards so you, you can enjoy it. I think just a couple are really worth highlighting. The curve is interesting to me because the curve is already very steep, the yield curve from Fed funds to tens. Where, where could you be wrong? Well, if the Fed does shift gears and move towards tightening or hiking sooner than we expect, then we could see a bear flattening led, led by, the, by the front end coming up. The interesting thing about that yield curve chart that we showed earlier is that uh, a lot of the movement in longer term yields happens well before the Fed ever hikes. So tens get to their new sort of equilibrium level or terminal level before the Fed ever hikes. So that part of the curve gets out there. It's the front end that comes up and when you see the actual flattening occur. So that could happen sooner than we think, and that would flatten rather than steepen the curve. And then the other side of that is we could also be wrong on, uh, on inflation stabilizing and growth picking up a bit. Growth could disappoint. Inflation, we got inflation data this morning, 1.7% on the core measure year on year. That could move lower. It's not our base case. It could. If it did, that could bring longer term yields down and the, the curve would flatten out. So that's one area where I think we're, we're, we could be wrong. Uh, the other area I think that's interesting to highlight would be the dollar. Uh, we could have some other currencies that strengthen even further. So the euro, it could be mired in a deflationary environment, which would probably push up the, the value of the euro versus other currencies, and that, that could be a risk. Uh, one area, when you think of stronger dollar, you immediately think of weaker yen, sort of flip side of that. So where could we be wrong? Uh, in that story, well, maybe maybe Ebonomics. Abonomics is n not as successful in generating growth and getting sustained inflation like, like uh, the market currently expects. And then the yen strengthens. So th there's some risk there. So I always think it's important to, to think about what, how things could go wrong, the alternative paths compared to what our our base case scenario is. So there's a, there's a few of them there. And the final slide is just our summary 
of where we are on the on the I would call the big four, the four horsemen, the four key things you need to know for the year ahead. This chart is I, I think it's information rich because it shows where we are, which is the P and R symbol there. Hopefully you can you can see the little P and R, and then where the average is over long periods of time, where the FOMC forecast is, and where the consensus is puts it in perspective. So on growth, you can see us there. We're, we're about 2.5, or a little shade to the left of that. The long-term average is about 2.5. The consensus is a little higher than that. And then you might see the triangle to the right of the economic growth bracket. And you might say to yourself, wow, the Fed's off the charts. Literally and figuratively, I think, is appropriate here. They are at 3.2% for the year. It doesn't fit on the chart because the chart shows the range over the cycle, and that's beyond the range. So we just put it on there anyway. The inflation, again, we're still expecting pretty low inflation, maybe not as low as what we've seen here in 2013, which is that blue line, the blue circle, excuse me, but certainly and importantly below the 20-year average. Unemployment rate, the unemployment rate could fall, but it may fall not necessarily for the right reasons, because the labor force participation rate has gone down. We are down at 6.7%. Uh, so consensus here, when we updated this, was 6.8. They're probably going to have to lower that now. So just from a forecasting perspective, you have to take into account the trend in the labor force, and we could very well get close to 6% by the end of the year. That's, I think, not unreasonable. And the final one would be the 10-year note. We expect yields, you can see, to rise over the full balance of the year, but still remain below the longer-term average, that orange little uh, X marks the spot. So that's the summary. And I would love to stop there and take any questions that you have with the time that's remaining. Great. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thanks for sharing the outlook and your views there for 2014. We have just a few questions to get started. I want to take just a second to encourage everyone to ask any questions they have at this point. We'll see them coming through along the Q&A box. Um, but Jeffrey, given your views and the outlook you've just shared, where do you see value, or where does Payton and Regal see value in the market? Can you comment a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So they, you know, the biggest worry I think people have is that interest rates were, are going to sort of skyrocket. Uh, that was a story in, in 2013. And the way we think about that is, and the best thing I would do is refer to our previous webcast, Kim, which, which we did last September, I believe, which just broke down what we really think moves interest rates. It's growth on one hand, expectations for future rates, and inflation. Those are the three, the three big factors. We call them the three building blocks. And growth has certainly picked up, which is good. That points towards a little bit higher interest rates but not dramatically higher. If I can, I'm going to go back to an earlier chart. Apologize for the rapid flipping here in the in section that I that I skipped through. Uh, right here it is. So that this is just looking at growth over a long period of time, nominal growth, and it's it's a pretty good job of explaining where longer term interest rates are. You can see the the bump up there on interest rates in 2013. But Based on what we're seeing on growth, and this nominal figure for growth should account for not just economic growth, but inflation activity, it doesn't point to significantly higher yields from here. In fact, it says yields are probably sort of fairly valued somewhere between 25 3%, maybe uh, you know, a little bit higher. So we don't expect a, a massive uh, upside in yield interest rates. So investors that are at home that are worried about that outcome, that's not one of our big concerns, and we, and you should ask when would we become concerned about that? Cleveland, would you? What, what are you looking at? Again, it's going to be what's our outlook for growth? Do we see inflation, and do we think we're closer to hiking or a change in the hiking cycle? So, you know, on those counts, growth yes is looking a little bit better. The other two though still point to relatively low yields. So there's there's I don't think there's a dramatic. Uh, dire scenario that, that a lot of people worry about are out there. Where are the pockets of value? We, I mean, one of them we highlighted was high yield, of course. There's probably some pockets in, in other parts of the fixed income that we would that we would point out. Municipal bond market could be a, an interesting opportunity. 
Uh, we're not as enthusiastic about mortgages, just given that they enjoyed, again, a big uh, you know, tidal flow when the Fed was buying. And if we're right and the Fed is going the other way, dialing back on their QE, that might not be the best place to be. But certainly, there's ways to, and, and clients need income, there's ways to earn income that are not in a treasury yield. I understand the risks that people are worried about with treasury yields going up. There are other little pockets of the of the bond market where you can still earn income and sort of mitigate some of those duration risks, and uh, you know th so those opportunities are are still out there. Thanks, Jeffrey. I've got sort of a add-on question to what you've just discussed. Given all the discussion in the market regarding interest rate projections, what is your current view on holding bond funds that focus on quote negative duration as a hedge? Well, I mean, in terms of bond funds, prop, that probably is a question um, not for the not for the macro guys. So, I, I think I'll I'll set that one aside, and then perhaps we can get someone who who would answer that question better and more directly. Sure, we'll we'll um, we'll get some follow up going on that. Just one more question here, unless I see any others stream in while we're speaking. But there's been a lot written about the slack in the labor market. Some think that the labor market still has ways to go in recovery. Others think that uh, we're nearing full employment. What is your stance on the tightness of the labor market? So it's a tricky situation. The unemployment rate has fallen rapidly. It's at 6.7, as I said. You know, full employment, according to the Fed, is maybe 5.2 to 5.5. So just on the, if you just looked at U3 unemployment, you would say, there's a lot less slack in the labor market than we thought there was going to be and than we, when we were, you know, a year ago. Um, but we think there's a complication in this, especially in this particular historical episode. The labor force participation rate has gone down dramatically. Our view is that it's not all due to people retiring. That's I know that's a big theme, right, that... But, uh, well, it's no, you should ignore the decline in labor force participation rate because, you know, baby boomers leaving the labor force. And I'm, sh I'm sure that's part of it. But an interesting thing that I'll point out is that in 2007, government statisticians knew about the aging population, had the, the data, did a forecast of the labor force participation rate. By 2012, they thought the labor force participation rate so the share of the working age population that's working, that's looking for a job, they thought that it would be 66. It's currently 62.8. So the 66 took into account the demographic or the structural downdraft. So I, I think that some of the decline is due to demographic, sure, but there's a, there's a weakness here that tells us the labor market conditions are not as good as a 6.7% unemployment rate would tell you. So the you, you question you probably ask is, well, what should we follow then, Cleveland? Well, you can look at U6, which is a broader measure of the unemployment rate. You can look at what we like to do, the employment to population ratio, the prime age working uh, people. That is the 25 to 54-year-old age cohort. That has bottomed. It has not recovered yet. And so we, we expect that to be the signal or the sign that things are really strengthening in the labor market. And I don't think we're, we're there yet. So bottom line, Kim, sorry, to answer your question in a more direct and clear manner, 6.7% is overstating the health of the labor market and understating the slack in the labor market, in our opinion. Great. Thank you, Jeffrey, for sharing your views and for your presentation today. Just a reminder to everyone, we will have a copy of the presentation available to you as a resource, so um, look for that in your email. Um, we'll be sending that out shortly. Uh, we want to be respectful of everyone's time today, so we are wrapping up here. But hey, Kim, could I say one more thing before we go? Yeah, I wanted to I wanted to ping it back to you for your final comment. So oh, excellent. Away. So so in addition to our you know summary today, I think also if people are tuned in now. In a couple of weeks, we don't have the exact date or time, but we will do a, a global version of the outlook with a little bit more focus on the rest of the world, which we couldn't necessarily cram into uh, the, the webcast today. So we're going to do an, a, an additional one. So if there are questions that are, are more focused on that, 
you know, please follow your email, and you know, we'll be we'll be back talking to you again very very soon. Great, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, everyone, thanks for attending today. Like Jeffrey says, um, please don't uh, hesitate to reach out to us. We always welcome your questions and look to be a resource to you. Uh, we have Greg Brown, a principal here at Payton and Regal listed. His contact information is on your screen. So if you'd like to follow up um, to set up further meetings or have questions that we weren't able to get to today or more specific questions about uh, the markets or uh, investment areas, please don't hesitate to contact us. Everyone have a great day. Thank you.